Here's a guy who's frustrated that skeptics still don't believe the New Testament stories about Jesus. Hmm. So according to biblical research, there are reliable, historically confirmed eyewitness accounts that testify of Jesus' resurrection. Who's biblical research? And what do you mean by reliable? My understanding of how history is studied is that there aren't just reliable accounts and unreliable accounts. There are many levels of reliability. In fact, there are 27 documents written by nine eyewitnesses or their contemporaries that describe numerous miraculous events. Who were the eyewitnesses? We can't say that the gospel authors were eyewitnesses because we don't even know who they were. We don't know if the gospels are firsthand. None of them announce who their authors are. The reason the gospels are named after apostles is because two early scholars, Priapus and Irenaeus, inferred from the text that they were written by apostles. But few modern scholars agree that their inferences are very well supported. And many of these documents contain historically confirmed eyewitness testimony that goes back to the time of these events. How were they historically confirmed? I've heard Frank Turek argue that since there are details in the accounts which match archaeological findings, that this means that they are eyewitness or first-hand accounts. But that doesn't follow. Second and third-hand accounts can carry accurate details, but that doesn't make them eyewitness accounts or as reliable as eyewitness accounts. And the evidence demonstrates that the narrative is not invented, not embellished, or the product of deception. I doubt that, but even if it isn't a product of invention, embellishment, or deception, it could still be the product of misperception. Now we know this because the New Testament documents meet all seven tests of the historical reliability questions. And we recently went through the historical test, the link will be down in the description below. So according to the New Testament documents and what has been verified, we know that 1. The documents are early, most of them written between 15 to 40 years later, well within two generations of the events. That leaves an awful lot of room for embellishment, doesn't it? 2. They contain eyewitness testimony. Not in the Gospels, they don't. 3. They contain independent eyewitness testimony from multiple sources. Where? Not only do those Gospels not contain eyewitness testimony, they don't contain independent testimony either. Many of the Gospels copy from one another, sometimes inconsistently, and sometimes nearly verbatim, which would be weird for independently given testimonies. You'd think that the stories, if they were independent accounts, would differ significantly in wording, but be consistent in content. Instead, the Gospels are sometimes almost identical in wording and content, and at other times wildly inconsistent in both wording and content content. This looks to me like some gospel authors copied directly from earlier gospel writings in some parts and tried to recreate earlier gospels from memory in other parts. So in which of the other New Testament books do we find these independent eyewitness testimonies? 4. The New Testament documents are written by trustworthy people who taught and lived by the highest standard of ethics and who died for their testimony. Their testimony about what? There is no evidence that they were martyred for their belief in the resurrection. No historical documents, inside or outside the Bible, say that they died because they believed that Jesus rose from the dead. And an earlier point that Bill made, that the disciples were all willing to die for their faith. I didn't hear one piece of evidence for that. I hear that claim a lot, uh, but having read every Christian source from the first 500 years of Christianity, I'd like him to tell us what the piece of evidence is that the disciples died for their belief in the resurrection. Jesus was executed for sedition against the Roman occupation of Judea. Anyone who is known to have been an associate of Jesus would be in danger of execution as well. Not a single one of them would need to believe that he rose from the dead in order to be a target of Roman persecution. Simply having been an associate of Jesus would have been enough to get them executed even if they did not believe that he rose from the dead. Apologists love to say that the martyrs died for their beliefs, as though their deaths make it more likely that they really believed in the resurrection resurrection, when in reality their deaths need not have had anything to do with the resurrection, whether the resurrection happened or not. 5. The New Testament documents describe events, locations, and individuals corroborated by archaeology and other writers. Are there any extra-biblical writers who corroborate the claims that Jesus did miracles? If not, then that doesn't help your case that those miracles occurred. And even if there were such sources which did corroborate the claims that miracles occurred, I wouldn't find that to be sufficient evidence to convince me that anyone ever rose from the dead. 6. The documents describe some events that enemies tacitly admit are true and we call this enemy attestation. Were these accounts written by the enemies themselves? Did they describe any of the miracles? And lastly, seven, the documents describe events and details that are embarrassing to the authors and even to Jesus himself. 
This dude doesn't give any examples, but an example I have heard is the story of John the Baptist. John the Baptist baptizes Jesus, which is counterintuitive to the idea that Jesus is God incarnate. Why would God need to be baptized? And also, baptisms are typically administered by someone who is clerically superior, which, if Jesus was God, John the Baptist certainly would not have been. Historians do take this as evidence that this part of the story is not made up. However, it is also evidence that Jesus did not believe himself to be God incarnate. If you believed you were God himself, why would you think you needed to be baptized? Now what does this tell us? Well, these historically confirmed eyewitness documents tell us the following story. 1. At the time and place, and in the manner predicted by the Old Testament, Jesus arrives in Jerusalem and claims to be the Messiah. He teaches profound truths and, according to numerous independent eyewitnesses, performs 35 miracles, some on groups of people, and then rises from the dead. Who were these independent eyewitnesses? They certainly weren't the gospel authors. And even if the gospel authors were independent eyewitnesses, that's pretty far from what I would find to be convincing evidence of the occurrence of a miracle. In order for me to be convinced that a guy rose from the dead, I would have to personally conduct an autopsy on the guy and see extensive brain necrosis with my own eyes. Then I'd have to see the guy get up off the autopsy table and start walking and talking. Nothing short of that would convince me that resurrection as possible. No testimony could ever convince me. Certainly no testimony recorded years, let alone decades, after the fact. 2. Once cowardly and unbelieving eyewitnesses suddenly begin to boldly proclaim Jesus' resurrection in the face of persecution and death. Nowhere inside or outside the Bible does it say that anyone was persecuted or martyred for believing that Jesus rose from the dead. Now misguided people may die for a lie that they think is true, but they will not die for a lie that they know is a lie. And there's no evidence that anyone died for believing that Jesus rose from the dead. But even if they did die for that belief, that wouldn't make it true, would it? The New Testament writers were in a position to know the real truth about the resurrection. Given that we have no reason to believe that they were eyewitnesses, I don't see how that's the case. Even if they were eyewitnesses, that wouldn't make them infallible and unsusceptible to delusion or illusion. It certainly wouldn't make them so unsusceptible to such cognitive fallibilities to convince me that a resurrection actually happened. 3. In the very city of Jesus' death and tomb, a new movement, called the church, is born and quickly spreads by peaceful means on the belief that Jesus has risen from the dead. So what? How is that evidence of anything? Now, this is difficult to explain if there was no resurrection. No, it isn't. It's easily explainable by the idea of people preaching that there was a resurrection. When people preach false things, sometimes some people fall for it. How could Christianity begin in a hostile city like Jerusalem if Jesus' body was still in the tomb? The hostile religious and government authorities would have exposed Christianity as fraudulent by exposing the body of Jesus. Does the absence of a body from a tomb make it reasonable to believe in a resurrection? Can you not think of any alternate explanation more probable than resurrection? For thousands of Jerusalem Jews, including Pharisee priests, abandoned five of their most treasured beliefs and practices to adopt strange ones after converting to Christianity. Like what? It seems the strange practices were introduced by Paul and were actually resisted by earlier followers of Jesus like James. Why did Paul get into an argument with James over the requirements for being a Christian as is described in Acts 15 and 21? Did James just not believe enough? 5. Saul, the most well-known enemy of the church, is suddenly converted and becomes its most prolific proponent. He travels the ancient world to proclaim the resurrection, suffering persecution and martyrdom. Where does it say that said persecution and martyrdom had anything to do with his specific belief in the resurrection, as opposed to his allegiance with a guy who was crucified for sedition? If there was no resurrection, then why did the greatest enemy of Christianity suddenly become its greatest leader? First of all, he wasn't its greatest enemy. Nero was a far greater enemy than Paul ever was. Secondly, pretty much any non-supernatural explanation you can think up would be more convincing than the idea that a guy rose from the dead, especially by supernatural means. Maybe on the road to Damascus, Paul encountered an extraterrestrial who disguised himself as Jesus, who told him to become a Christian for the lulls. Obviously, I don't believe that this is what actually happened, but it would literally be easier to believe than the idea that Jesus was raised from the dead by a supernatural God. Why did he willingly suffer persecution and death? 
Where do you get the idea that it was willing? Six, James, the skeptical brother of Jesus, suddenly becomes convinced that his brother is the son of God, and then he becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And also rejects the strange new practices which Paul proposed. He later suffers martyrdom at the hands of the high priest. Now, we all know that family members can be the most difficult people to convince to our religious viewpoint. And James began as an unconvinced brother of Jesus. You can see this in John 7, 5. Now, if there was no resurrection, then why did James, who was called the just by the second century historians Clement and Hegesippus, suddenly come to believe that his brother was really the Messiah, unless he saw the resurrected Christ? Again, nearly any non-supernatural explanation you could pull out of your bum would be more convincing no matter how far-fetched. Why would James become the leader of a church in Jerusalem and suffer a martyr's death? Because any follower of a rebel who tried to overthrow the Roman occupation of Judea would suffer a martyr's death regardless of whether he believed that rebel to have returned from the dead or not. And lastly, seven, the Jewish enemies of Christianity don't deny the evidence but offer faulty naturalistic explanations to account for it. Theistic explanations are inherently incoherent. They posit the existence of a timeless, spaceless, disembodied mind. Such a notion is self-contradictory. No coherent naturalistic explanation, no matter how improbable, could possibly be more faulty than the idea that Jesus is God. Which fails miserably in the hands of the truth. Now going through all these points and seeing that there is historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, why are skeptics still skeptical about the evidence? Because in order to believe that a guy rose from the dead, I would have to see it myself. No documents of any kind could ever convince me that such a thing occurred. No matter how much evidence you provide, they still want more. Well, I'm very specific about what evidence I want to see. I guarantee you that I would not disingenuously dismiss any and all evidence of a resurrection. Show me a guy in person with a fully necrotic brain, get up and walk and talk, and I will believe in resurrection. Documents and claims will never be good enough, but if I could be an eyewitness to such a thing myself, that would convince me. Now it's either they're not truly willing to be convinced, or that they have already been convinced, but they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. I'm both willing to be convinced, and I have not yet been convinced. Let's say, for the sake of argument, that I fall into one of the options of the false dichotomy you just described. If I am either not willing to be convinced, or I'm already convinced and just in denial, then what's the point of apologetics? If you are right about me and other skeptics, then you are essentially admitting the futility and pointlessness of making arguments for the resurrection. Everyone who helps me out on Patreon, you're a big help. Thanks so much.